So I've been thinking a lot about death lately. <laughs> it's an old pickup line of mine. Works really well. No, seriously, I've been thinking a lot about death lately uh, amid the pandemic, uh, but also uh, here in our home, uh, for Karen and me, there's been a lot of death. My father, uh, 92 years old, passed away in March at the beginning of the pandemic. Not because of the pandemic, but Alzheimer's and old age. Uh, Karen, in the last year, has had her best friend from the Bronx pass away. She had her longest tenured employee and beloved employee, a critical employee still, pass away at the age of like 66 from lung cancer. Um, and, uh, she also had her stepbrother uh, pass away. And then my kids, my two children, both had three of their grandparents pass away in one month in March. Yeah, my dad and then their mother's uh, mother and stepfather. And then also this week, within the span of eight days, I'm uh, either conducting or organizing two funerals. We're finally sort of doing the funeral memorial service for my father this coming Sunday, and I've been working with the pastor to coordinate that. And then this past Sunday, we uh, did the funeral here at the house, outdoors, social distance, all that, uh, for Karen's nephew, um, who had died at 26, 27, uh, from addiction and uh, overdose. And his mother uh, is Karen's cousin, but they grew up in, under the same roof in the Bronx. She was basically Karen's you know, fourth sister. Anyway, amid all of this death, and particularly since I, I gave the message at uh, the funeral this last Sunday, I've been thinking about it more and more, but especially this notion of... of a funeral, of a memorial service, uh, and what it is, and what it means, and how it's changed. And, but particularly, as I've been working with a pastor on my father's coming up this Sunday, um, I went back through my father's end-of-life notes. They had met with a uh, end-of-life counselor to go over everything, from finances to medical to power of attorney to will to, you know, er, his funeral service, etc. And some of his notes that they had done with this end-of-life counselor uh, were, regard, uh, were regarding the funeral, but many of his notes were sort of the types of things that a counselor would use uh, to help the person begin to reflect on their own life. And my father was not a person prone to self-reflection. Live life, be happy, be positive was sort of his motto. You know, serve others and serve God. That was definitely how he lived his life. He didn't spend a lot of time in self-reflection, whereas my mother was just the opposite. Very deep. Very introspective. But it was fascinating to find in my notes, in my father's notes, one little thing that he had said about what he wanted his funeral to be. He said he wanted it to be, and this is a phrase we've all heard before, he wanted it to be a celebration of life. And very often as pastors, having been a pastor, you know, off and on for 15, 20 years, um, and still occasionally doing pastoral um, tasks, very often when we hear a celebration of life regarding a funeral for a pastor, <laughs> we somewhat cynically think that, yeah, you want it to be a celebration of your life. <laughs> but I know my father well enough to know that he, because of his Swedish roots, he was a very humble man. He was. He liked to talk a lot, but he was a genuinely humble man. And so for him, celebration of life wasn't celebration of his life. In fact, the way he structured the actual liturgy of the worship service for his funeral um, indicates that he did not want it about him. He did not want to be eulogized. He wanted it to be an actual um, service about you know God and what God has done for all of us and so forth. That's not the point. The point is he had said, I want it to be a celebration of life. And for him, that meant I don't want it to be about darkness and grieving and sort of funeral-esque I want it to be positive. And it's funny because in other parts of Dad's notes, he went, he actually said, well, sort of my life motto is be positive, serve people, and you know, whatever else. Positive, positive, positive. Don't look at the negative. Keep that away. It's definitely how he lived his life. And that rubbed off on his kids. And I think that's in many ways a fantastic thing, to the capacity to always find the good in things. Of course, the downside of that is 
very often we're always finding the good and we get 10 years down the road and we realize, well, I'm making good out of this. You know, I'm finding the good in all of this, but this isn't actually what I want. That's a side note. So I was wrestling, wrestling with sort of my dead father's wishes as the pastor and I planned out this um, memorial service that's going to happen this Sunday online uh, for in our immediate family. And I realized, or I was reminded of, the fact that I've never liked that term, celebration of life. I think it's something that religion in America, particularly in the last 50 years, and American culture have grabbed onto and seized sort of as what a funeral should be or what we should look at in death. I want it to be a celebration of life. And I've never liked that. I've never liked that. And it, it's a bit ironic coming from my father, who was 92, who was definitely old school, you know, lived through the Depression and World War II and all that. He was definitely an old, salty old soul. Well, not really salty, but an old, old guy. And saw the world largely through old guy's eyes. But he embraced this notion of celebration of life, in his case, as I said, because of the positivity aspect of it. And I guess my um, sort of rubbing against that and, and, and we're doing it the way he wanted. It's his funeral, fuck it, I don't care, let's do it your way. But in my own reflections, and particularly in the funeral that I conducted this past Sunday here at the house, in the yard, I don't believe in the notion of a celebration of life for ultimately the reason my father wanted it to be a celebration of life. I don't believe in always making everything positive. In fact, I think that's part of the problem and why my business, Badass Counseling, where I'm working not just with the C-suite people and Wall Street people um, and people who've done very, very well in life, but people at all walks of life, um, it's because they've always sought to be positive or they've, they've not been allowed to look at their own pain. And that's why I value the notion of funeral as grieving, keening, as the Irish call it, and remembering and feeling the weight of the loss. I absolutely believe in that. So in the funeral that I conducted this past Sunday, um, one of the aspects that I talked about with this young man who had passed away from an overdose, good kid, good kid, but he was addicted. And we've all dealt with our own addictions in our own ways, and addictions come in all forms. But this particular addiction is a brutal one. Anyway, I talked about how the easy or the sort of natural thing to reflect on at the time of death, but particularly in the death of a 26-year-old, 27-year-old, excuse me, is the notion of fragility of life. And isn't that what we're all wrestling with to some degree or another? In fact, to a heightened degree for most of us amid the pandemic, the notion of the fragility of life, that we're wearing masks, we're keeping social distance, we're staying in our homes, we're taking all of these measures because life is fragile. My life is fragile. The life of the people around me is fragile. Um, the life of the old people, the health of the old people in my life, such as you know a couple of my neighbors whom I love very much. They're particularly vulnerable, right? I'm over 50 now, so I'm in, moving into that vulnerable stage. But the notion of the fragility of life, that has, even that has nothing to do with the pandemic. At the time of a funeral, at the time of a death of someone closest, close to us, the notion of the fragility of life creeps into our thinking. We're forced to confront that I could walk out to check my mail today, get hit by a car, and go into a coma, or get hit by a car and die, or slip and fall, crack my head, and have an aneurysm, or whatever medical things happen when you slip and fall and crack your head open, right? Brain sloshing around in there. A lot of room to slosh, not a lot of brain, so that would not be good for me. Point is, where we naturally go in the time of death and in the time of funeral is we go to the notion of fragility of life, but what I was pushing this last week and have been thinking about in my own father's death and sort of as I move towards my own, uh, you know, mortality and is that funerals and death 
don't just force us to complicate, uh, contemplate the fragility of life, but they force us. And this is the reason we, we embrace the notion of celebration of life, because if we don't, if we don't package it in pretty bows and cotton candy and rainbows out your asshole, if we don't make it all sunny and happy, then we're forced to confront fragility of life, but even more so what funerals and what death do is they force us to see pain. 27 year old died and his mother, Karen, my girlfriend's cousin, and someone that Karen has taken care of almost full time and has done so much for because she herself now has a brain tumor that keeps growing. Doctors give her a few months to live, if that. And she's sitting at the funeral of her son who just died in June from an overdose. That funeral forces us to see pain. You can't stand before a mother or a father who has lost a child at the age of 27. And who, by the way, she also lost her beloved dog of 13 years, little Sierra. Mangy dog, but just a loving dog. At the same time, literally weeks apart from the death of her son. You can't sit in front of this person, you can't stand in front of this person and not see pain, even if she's not crying, simply by knowing those two little nuggets of her story. You can't help but see her pain. Kids aren't supposed to die before parents, right? This kid died at 27. You can't help but see her pain, but you can't help but see his pain. The amount of pain it must take to drive someone to become addicted to opioids. You can't help but see the pain in the kid. And when one of his cousins read from his personal journals where it said where he was writing a letter to a friend of his who had just died of opioid abuse, saying he missed him, saying, why didn't you, why didn't you? And now here we are reading the journals of the one who wrote that letter who's just died. You can't help but see the pain. And what makes funerals so hard is that pain, seeing someone else's pain makes us uncomfortable. But for those who are really deep, or those who allow themselves to see, funerals not only force us to see the pain of the deceased and to see the pain of the mother or the pain of those closest to the deceased, but it forces us to see our own pain and to feel our own sadness. Our own pain over death, our own pain over the loss of this person, our own pain of all that is going on in my life right now. See, once we crack open that door, right? Once we crack open that door to some of the pain and to some of the fear, some of the fear of future pain, once we open that door, it's, it's very easy for all of that to come out. And that's why we don't wanna go near dead people. We don't wanna go near dying people because it turns up shit inside of me. I don't wanna fucking deal with that. Right? I want to just keep cruising along. I want to be positive. I want to focus on my own life. I don't have time. I don't have energy. I don't want to be overwhelmed by something I don't know how to control. Right? All that shit goes through us. And I've been there, man. I've had people very close to me die. My college roommate, senior year of college, we played football together, committed suicide. You know? I had friends from, you know, when I was in the military, went to the academy, who died in combat or who died in training exercises. You know, my father just died and so forth. Um, so I know what goes on inside, and we've all experienced it to some greater or lesser degree. But funeral and death force us to not only see the pain of others and to feel it, and to feel another's pain is heavy and it's powerful and it's good for the soul. It deepens us. See, seeing and feeling the pain of others breeds compassion inside of us, has the potential to breed compassion. And so it's a good thing. But as I said, it forces us to see our own pain but even deeper than that, not only to see the pain that I'm experiencing in my own life and the fear of future pain, getting a disease or losing money or getting uh, my hours cut back at work or whatever it might be, not only forces to see the own, my own pain of what is happening or could happen to me, but it forces me, if I'm really allowing it in, if I'm really being reflective and introspective, it forces me to see the pain that I inflict. Now we're getting into some deep shit. Now we're getting into the wicked stuff of fucking funerals.
and death, and dying, and loss. Once we start letting in the pain and seeing the pain of others and of ourselves, we also start seeing what an ass I've been, what a loser I've been in my treatment of others, ungentlemanly, uncivil, mean, rude, hurtful in my treatment of others. There were those at this funeral on Saturday with this young man who passed away. There were those who indicted themselves, not legally, but indicted themselves in failing to show compassion and in, in failing to show fellowship, just decent kindness, or in pulling back their fellowship, pulling back their kindness from this young man who had passed away. And they brought it up themselves. That's pretty admirable. To look at it is one thing, but then to verbalize it, to talk about it. One person did it during the service in sort of a, where people could talk about the young deceased person, and this person said, I failed him. I realize I could have done more. So this notion of self-indictment and that funeral and death and loss pushes us, pushes us to self-reflect, to see ourselves, not just as we want to see ourselves, but to see ourselves, well, as my 92-year-old mother says, warts and all. To see my failings, to see my shortcomings, it convicts us. Funerals and death convict us. They force us to see pain that we inflict. And then there's yet something even deeper. And I believe this really gets to the heart of all of my life's work. As a pastor, as a counselor, as a writer, as a speaker, etc., etc., as a friend. It forces us to see pain and in opening the door to the pain that has been done to us or that we experience in opening the door to the pain of this deceased person and those around, in opening the door to the pain I inflict, it potentially also opens the door to the pain of my past. The pain of my past, the real stuff that keeps me weighted down, the real stuff that is causing your depression, the real stuff that is causing your anxiety. All of my life's work is about reaching down somebody's fucking throat and pulling out all the pain, all the crud, all of the negative beliefs about self and life and the world that this person was taught or had inflicted upon them at age 2, 3, 4, 5, 8, 13, 19, 24. There's so much pain in there. And very often, life sends opportunities. And they don't feel like opportunities. They feel like shit is what they feel like. But they, the life or God or the universe sends opportunities to look at that, to become, as the Buddhists say, aware. Buddhism talks about this notion of awareness. Or as my mother said, naming the beast is half the problem. Getting it out, looking at it and saying, the pain that I'm feeling inside goes back all the way back here. Now, of course, in our common culture, and especially among tough guys, among, you know, your average straight white male, it's, oh, fuck that, don't be a fucking victim, fuck you, you need to toughen up, you need to take responsibility for your shit today, you need to get over that shit from the past, which is the dumbest motherfucking shit anybody can fucking say. Those are words that come from someone who has no concept of the power of shit that happens in our childhood. I'll get clients saying to me all the time, male or female, old or young, I'll get clients saying to me all the time, but I don't want to be a victim. But you know, I don't, I, I don't want to be a victim. I don't want to dwell on that shit. Or I don't want to be a victim. I don't, you know, my shit wasn't that bad. Plenty of people have had it worse. I don't want to be a victim. Victim, 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 victim. And I say, are you fucking stupid, man? I mean, I love you, you know? I love all my clients, I do. You know, as people. I love you, but that's just fucking dumb. You were a victim. For as smart as you are, that is an incredibly dumb thing to say. You're not a dumb person. That's a dumb thing to say. You were a victim. You had parents who did X, Y, or Z, or you had parents who didn't do, you know, B, C, and D. You had things that were done to you and you were a fucking child. And the notion that the human being can just push that away and be done with it and not have it not affect their life is ludicrous. And it shows absolute naivete in the notion of the spiritual development of children and the long-term impact of that spiritual or lack of spiritual development. 
And so what we have to do to be free of that pain, what we have to do to become in union with our truest self. See, I reach out people's throat, I pull out the pain. But the second thing I'm doing as I'm doing that is I'm reaching down their throat and I'm pulling out their truest self. I'm not putting anything in. I'm helping them discover who they really are, who they were created to be before all that shit got packed in there. And so what it takes, first and foremost, is acknowledging the pain and saying, yeah, honestly, I was a victim. It doesn't mean I have to be the rest of my life, but to not say that you were, to not, it means to not acknowledge what was done. It's attempting to deny something or suppress something. And people think, well, if I just forget about it or push down, stuff it down, I'll just stuff it down. I'll just forget about it. I'll just make a joke about it. That it'll go away and it never does. See, the soul is more powerful than the will. And despite your best efforts to try to pack your shit away or walk away from it, it will always come back and it will come back stronger and stronger and stronger until it shuts down your life because you're living a life that isn't you. So back to this notion of death and loss. What death and loss force us to do is to see pain but primarily to acknowledge our own pain and to allow it out through the tears, through the sobbing, through the words to articulate what the sources of the pain are presently and past tense and fear of future pain. And that's the great gift in death. That is the great gift in decay and in loss. It's the gift of do I have the courage to see my own pain, to acknowledge it, to allow it out so that I might be unburdened of it? We have to purge it out. We have to flush out the pain. It's pain that isn't allowed to be flushed out. When we tell a child, you know, be a big boy, don't cry, which is total garbage. When we tell them that, the pain gets stuffed inside. And we think, oh, that's toughness. No, real toughness isn't never showing pain. Real toughness is doing whatever the fuck you want whenever you want. Real toughness means if I feel sad, I cry. I don't give a shit what other ass lickers, you know, say I shouldn't feel. I don't give a shit what people say, oh, the definition of tough is, fuck you. Real toughness is if I feel sad, I feel sad. I let it out. If I feel gentle and kind and playing with the little dolls with my daughter when she's three years old, then I do that. Helping an old lady across the street. Or at times, standing up and being tough. It's not just tough all the time. Tough all the time is garbage. That's not badass. That's somebody who's actually weak because they're afraid of what others will think of them if they show their real emotions. Chew on that one. So anyway, as you confront death during this pandemic, as you confront, if not death, the fear of death, as you confront loss and fragility of life and so forth, I would encourage you to begin to answer the question, to at least ask yourself the question and begin to answer through writing or through speech. What is this death? What pain is this death forcing me to look at? Pain outside of myself, pain inside of myself, pain that I commit, pain from my past. What is this opportunity forcing me to look at? And do I have the courage to look at it? Do I have the courage to let the pain out? That's the thought for today. Have a kick-ass day, and I look forward to seeing you soon.